Oh, there you go. Hi. 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 We have been reading to our neighbors and helping with sight words so they can learn. It seemed like fun. And then Ariel said it looked fun, so she joined too. I thought that it'd just be boring until I watched Ava do it. And it kind of looked fun, and so I decided to try it out, and I enjoyed it. I love reading to them. It helps me to read out loud better. We also do Animal of the Day. And I like how we can help them learn. And they kind of got a little bored of their teacher giving videos of this stuff, so their mom wanted to make it a little more fun for them. Ava and I have been hanging out a lot more, and I think we've grown closer as sisters. Face. I loved it so much. I actually asked our mom to reach out to more neighbors and ask them if if we can read to them, and they said yes. And we have three families. Three families, five kids. And what have you learned about God in the past couple weeks? I learned that he blesses a lot of people, even in this dark time. Sometimes um, life just throws at you complicated things, and you just gotta trust God and keep going through it. Bye. 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 How amazing is that? Those two girls are heroes, reading to their neighbors. Such a simple, a beautiful thing. You know, a number of weeks ago, I challenged us as a church family to be faithful in service and during this time. And I just want to say thank you because we continue to be so amazed and encouraged by the, the ways that you, Chapel Street Church, in your home campuses are finding to bless your neighbors, to love them, to share the love of Christ with them, to show and demonstrate the love of Christ with them. It's so encouraging. These, by the way, are just iPhone stories that you're sending to us, and we're sharing them with you each week, not to praise ourselves, but to encourage you and to let you know that you have an important role to play in making known the love of Christ in this time. If you've got a story to share, send that into us. Take an iPhone video of what God's doing in your family, in your neighborhood, in your community, and send it to us, and we'd love to share it so that more people can be encouraged by that. And we're so grateful for that, and we, I, I really do sense that while this is difficult, and we want it to be over, and we're longing for it to be, uh, you know, to be opened up again our world, God is teaching us something about what it means to love our neighbor in this time. And I'm so thankful that many of you are teaching us through what you're doing. Speaking of spe stepping into new ways to serve and to contribute to the mission of Chapel Street, since we went to sheltering in place and since we went to online services only, over 52 of you have made the first time decision to contribute financially to the mission of God here. And I want to say thank you. That's amazing. And we're so grateful for your contributions and to all who give during this time, your generosity financially enables us not only just to survive this time, but to thrive in the midst of it and to be positioned to meet the needs of the increasing needs of people who are falling on hard times and to further the mission of God here at Chapel Street Church. So thank you so much for being faithful and generous. You can give, there's multiple ways that you can give. And if you have not done so and you care about what's going on here, please consider giving electronically and recurring. It makes a huge difference. And we could not do what we're doing if it were not for your faithfulness and generosity and the provision of our God. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us this morning. Father, we thank you. And we, we, as we sang a moment ago, we do trust you. Your ways are higher than our ways. And we don't always see our way clear. We can hardly see beyond next week. And the world seems to shift and change so quickly. But we trust you. And we know, this we know, that you are on the throne and you are in control and you reign. And so now as we lift our hearts in worship through song and we come to your word, bless Pastor Brian as he preaches to us as we desperately need to know and want to know what it means to love. We thank you for loving us with an everlasting love, filling our hearts, pouring your love into us through the Holy Spirit, which you've given us. We praise you in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It is not arrogant. Or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices with truth. Love bears all things. <laughs> Believes all things. Hopes all things. <laughs> Endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then, face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. 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 My wife and I used part of our stay at home time to clean out and reorganize our attic. It was kind of like an archaeological dig of our lives. And we found all kinds of old stuff, including several boxes just stuffed full of old letters. I had letters from my mom and dad from when I was in college. I had letters from my brother Joe when we were just beginning ministry in two different places in the mid 80s. I had lots and lots of letters from Lorene during our dating days, and we've been married for 35 years. So why did I keep these all these years? Well, because they were personal. Uh, They were from people who knew me and loved me. And I kept them because they were written with a purpose in mind, maybe to connect me to family, uh, maybe to encourage me, maybe to give guidance during some difficult decisions. And when you think about it, all personal letters are like that. Let's Think about my youngest son who just graduated from college, didn't have a graduation ceremony, of course, that's hopefully coming later, but he finished. And so let's say I wanted to write him a letter uh, to encourage him as he looks for a job. As a father, I would probably choose to include a little bit of advice as to what to do and what not to do. I would say, for example, do. Be clear about your own gifts and your own uh, passions. I would say, do. Be on time. Don't be late. In fact, be early. I'd say, do your job and don't make excuses. I would say, do always a little more than expected. And that's really what we have here in 1 Corinthians. We're in a series now called The Greatest of These from the beautiful chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. And we're studying an ancient letter written by the Apostle Paul in the very first century to the church in an ancient city called Corinth. And over the last two weeks, Pastor Jeff's given us a great introduction to the city of Corinth and to the Corinthian church. Uh, I had the chance actually to visit uh, this site uh, a number of years ago and stand, stand in this exact location. Those are the ruins of the Temple of Apollo. And up in that hill on the back, there was uh, the ancient temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Now, Corinth was an affluent city uh, that was also uh, had a reputation for being somewhat morally corrupt. And that leads to a question, an obvious question, really. Why would Paul, in writing this letter to this church, uh, feel compelled to include an entire section uh, on love? He's writing to Christians, to believers. Why would he need to write about love? Well, I think first because there were lots of issues in that church, and Jeff has alluded to these. Here's just a few of these issues if you read the entire letter. They argued about their favorite teachers. I like this teacher. I like that teacher. And there was a man in the church who was in an immoral relationship with his father's wife. Not good. There were others still involved with temple or cult prostitution. Also not good. There were lawsuits between members of the church. Uh, There was chaos in worship. They were arguing about who had superior spiritual gifts. There was even drunkenness at the Lord's Supper. 
And even though they were affluent, uh, these folks were not yet a very generous people. And Paul understood that the common denominator and all of these issues was a fundamental misunderstanding of love, a lack of love. I think we can also assume that some of Paul's motivation comes from his own life. Because before meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus, we know that Saul of Tarsus was not known to be a man of love. Rather, he was not motivated by love. He was motivated by power and status, even rage. But all that changed for him when he met Jesus, or rather when Jesus met him. And from that point on, Paul was compelled to share with others the love that he had himself received. And finally, I think Paul just understood human nature. He knew that many of us naturally think of love as um, something that's really not. We tend to think of love in a selfish way, sort of a self-absorbed, needy way. Paul understood that most people, most of the time, think of love as a feeling that we have for other people, and he wants to describe it as something that we do. So Paul uses more than a dozen verbs to describe what love looks like. Last week, Jeff took us through verses four and five, of this chapter. Let me read them for you. Paul writes, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. You see the pattern there, love does and love does not. And today we look at just one verse and you're going to see that same pattern continue. 1 Corinthians 13, just verse 6. It, that is love, does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. First thing we're going to talk about today is what love does not. What love does not. When I was in the fourth grade, our family moved from Ohio to a community in New York. And so that meant I had to go to a brand new elementary school in a new town uh, right in the middle of the school year. It was January. And I remember being nervous about all that, being the new kid, not knowing anyone. But I was able, as I recall, to make some friends rather quickly. My teacher was nice and seemed to like me. But one of my clearest memories of that initial time was, uh, took place in the cafeteria. Uh, at this new school, there was a, a rule that uh, did not allow talking in the cafeteria at lunchtime. Uh, And so I think it was designed just to keep horseplay down and that sort of thing. We're supposed to be quiet and orderly and all that. Uh, But I was not aware of that rule because I was new. And so a couple weeks into my time there at lunchtime, I leaned over and said something to a friend. And one of the teachers who was sort of monitoring the cafeteria came running across the room, gleefully shouting, I caught him, I caught him, I caught him. Mr. Coffee, that's a detention for you. Now, I didn't even know why I was in trouble. I didn't know the rule. Uh, I didn't even know what detention meant. It just sounded a little bit like jail. But what I really was concerned about and confused by is if I had done something so terrible to deserve jail time, why was this lady so happy about it? Paul says, love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Now notice here, Paul's not describing love as a as a warm feeling we have toward other people. Rather, he's describing it in a sort of sharper way. He's describing love as having a kind of moral edge to it. Now, let me try to explain. The Greek word translated wrongdoing here means unrighteousness. It means injustice, even evil. And the word translated rejoice means to take delight in. So Paul's saying that love, properly understood, finds no delight, no joy in that which is wrong or immoral. Love does not participate or enjoy that which is unjust. Let me give a little example. I've talked about my dad here many times in the past, and he was a pastor for some 60 years, and for almost his entire ministry career, he was the lead pastor, the only pastor, in a series of smaller churches. But for a time while I was in college, he took a role as an associate pastor in a much larger church in Florida. In fact, this church was large enough to have kind of a developed campus, and they had their own gym right there on campus. And that was kind of amazing to my brother and myself. We'd never seen that before, and we both loved basketball. So we thought it was really cool. We always had a place to play ball in the summertime. So we started inviting uh, some of my brother's high school teammates over to join us so we could have a real game. We did that for a week or so, and then one day we noticed that the senior pastor of that church came and stood in the doorway and just watched us as we played. He didn't say anything. He just watched for a little while, then he left. 
Well, the next day we came back with our friends and we found the door to the gym was chained shut and padlocked. So we ran to our dad's office and said, hey, can you open up the gym for us? It's locked. And he told us that the senior pastor had decided that the gym was for use only by church members. And that was confusing to us because it was summertime. No one was using it. Why couldn't we use the gym? And then it dawned on us that two of the guys we'd been bringing with us, two of our friends who were my brother's teammates, happened to be African-American. Now, to be fair, I don't know for sure if that was the reason that he chained the door shut. All I do know is that my dad left that church within a year. Now, we've already mentioned some of the issues going on in the Corinthian church, lawsuits and immoral relationships and divisions and selfishness. What Paul is saying here is that these issues, this way of behaving is not only wrong, but it's inconsistent with love. It's a violation of what love is. And that lack of love, remember from the first week, actually threatens to render faith and ministry meaningless. So what would this look like? For us, 21st century North America. Obviously, it means all the same things Paul saw in the first century church. It means dissensions and immorality, selfishness and pride. But I think if Paul was writing to us today, he might say a few things about something as ordinary as social media. Now, I'm not saying that social media is evil. There's plenty of good out there. We've seen that. But we've also all seen the darker and uglier side of social media the vitriol, the, the accusations, the overt rooting for someone else's failure or even pain. I saw someone write, write this this week. Nothing excites us more than breaking news about the latest scandal among celebrities or politicians. We secretly rejoice to see self-righteous leaders fall from grace. We love scandals because they give us something to be disgusted about and to make us feel morally superior. Other people's sins make us look virtuous. Paul would say, love does not do that. What about something as every day as gossip? You know, just passing on little bits of information that we hear about. I like this definition of gossip. Gossip is the art of confessing someone else's sins. Now, we live in a world that seems obsessed with the confession of sins, only not our own. We want to confess uh, someone else's shortcomings, someone else's failures, even to the point where it, sometimes it seems like a kind of, of sport or form of entertainment. Even in the Christian community, when a celebrity pastor or a spiritual leader who's well-known fails or falls, immediately social media lights up thousands of likes, comments about judgment or shame. Now, when that happens, when there's an issue, should it be confronted? Yes. Should it be celebrated? No. Paul would say love does not do that. Love does not rejoice or take delight in that which is sinful or immoral or hurtful. When I was a sophomore in high school, I played quarterback on the sophomore football team uh, rather badly, as I recall. Found this picture in the attic, too. Um, we were playing one of the better teams in our league one day, and uh, we called a play. I was supposed to run the ball around the right side of the line, but the play broke down, and I found myself confronted by two or three defenders. And in an effort to sort of try to avoid being tackled, I tried to jump between two guys, and one of their guys... Uh, one of these 15-year-old kids with a mustache and full beard, you know what, what I'm talking about. He actually caught me in midair right with his shoulder, picked me up, and pushed me backwards a couple of yards, and then slammed me backwards down on the turf. My head snapped back, hit the ground. I literally saw stars. Uh, I don't think I ever lost consciousness, but I was definitely dazed, and I couldn't get up. I remember opening my eyes, and I saw this kid standing over me. Uh, the, their linebacker who hit me, and he was celebrating. He was yelling, I killed the quarterback. I killed the quarterback. And he was happy about it. I remember thinking to myself, what's wrong with this guy? What kind of person is happy when they think they've killed someone? Now, sometimes I don't finish my stories, and some of you are going to want to know the end of the story. Well, the team doctor came out, uh, looked me over, and he called for a stretcher. I said, no, 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 no. I, I, my mom's up there. I got to walk off the field. So he let me stand up and walk off, which is kind of weird. Then my dad came down to the bench to see how I was doing. You know, he was compassionate and caring. And he said to me, you know, how are you feeling? And I said, uh, 
And he said, well, how many fingers do I have up? And I said, two. He goes, well, good. Uh, your team kind of needs you out there. So I went out and played the rest of the game. Evidently, concussions weren't that big of a deal back then. Uh, Paul is saying here that love does not find pleasure in someone else's pain or misfortune. Love does not delight in wrongdoing, in your own sin or in the sin of others. Love does not participate in injustice. Love does not. And then Paul moves to what love does. What love does. Years ago, I read a story about a nine-year-old Little League baseball player named Billy. And by the way, um, my heart goes out to all you ball players out there who are not able to go out and play right now with your teams and athletes of all kinds. Hopefully, you'll get back on the field soon. But Billy was playing the game one day and running into third base, and he slid. And the umpire said, he's safe. And Billy jumped up and said, no, sir. He tagged me. I'm out. The umpire was surprised, but he changed his call and said, okay, you're out. At that point, Billy's teammates and probably a few dads were not very happy with Billy or the umpire. Well, a couple weeks later, Billy's playing another game. This time he's sliding in the home plate. The same umpire's there. And as he slides in, the umpire goes, you're out. Billy jumps up this time and says, no, sir, he missed me. I'm safe. And to everyone's surprise, the umpire again changed his call. He said, he's safe. The other coach comes running out of the dugout to argue the call because the umpire changed his call. The umpire stops him in his tracks and says, don't even, don't even bother, coach. I know Billy, and Billy always tells the truth. He's safe. Now, the question that little story raises is, do we rejoice with the truth? Paul says, love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. What's Paul mean by truth? I think two things. First, he does mean truth as being trustworthy and honest. Now, we all know it's human nature to distort the truth, to hide the truth, or to put it bluntly, to lie. If you're a parent, you know this because as parents, you don't have to teach your children how to hide the truth or how to occasionally lie. You have to teach them to be honest. You have to teach them to tell the truth. So why is that? Why do we as human beings have this tendency to misrepresent the truth? Why are we tempted, for example, to fudge a little uh, on the truth by padding our resume? I'm actually reading a biography right now of George Washington. And early in his military career, on several occasions, he actually fudged the casualty numbers of disastrous battles that he led in order to save his reputation. Even George Washington, the man that could not tell a lie. Why are we tempted to use social media, for example, to craft an image for ourselves that leads others to think that we're either more or better or happier than we actually are? Why do we hide the truth? To protect ourselves, right? To avoid getting in trouble, to be seen as better than we are, maybe to be liked. And we do that because we're afraid. We fear that if we speak the truth or if we allow the truth to be known, we'll be embarrassed or ashamed or we'll get in trouble, or we won't be loved. And at the root of that fear is a failure to fully understand who God is and what he thinks of us and what he's already done for us. That's why here at Chapel Street, every week, as often as we can, we say that we hope that every person that comes into contact with our church family will experience grace, grow in faith, and then learn to make an impact right where they are. Because it all begins with experiencing grace. In his letter to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul writes, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, Paul is saying there that when we understand and know the love of Christ, when we experience his grace, we are filled with the fullness of God. And therefore, we can live in truth because we are already loved. We are already forgiven. We don't have to hide. We can live and rejoice in truth. But secondly, Paul also means truth as in the truth of God's word. Psalm 119 says, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Love takes delight in the truth of God's word. 
I don't know if you're watching Pastor Jeff's uh, daily devotional videos. I hope you are. And one of the things that comes through clearly every time is that is Jeff's love for God's word. It just comes through. He takes delight in the truth and he passes that delight on to us. That's what Paul's saying. It means to rejoice with the truth of God's word. And that means at least four things. First, we are to rejoice in the truth about Jesus. In John 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is, Jesus is the truth and grace of God made flesh. Jesus is the only way for us to build and have a right relationship with God, our Father. Secondly, to rejoice with the truth means to rejoice in the truth of the gospel. In the same letter, Paul writes, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now, the gospel is the good news that our sins have been atoned for and that death has been conquered. I'm currently reading a book by Rodney Stark called The Rise of Christianity. And he claims that one of the keys to the growth of the early Christian community was how those earliest Christians behaved in the midst of two great pandemics that, that tore through the Roman Empire, claiming the lives of some 30% of the population. Because what happened was when others fled the pandemic, when others abandoned the sick, the Christians did not. They stayed and they offered compassion and care because they loved their neighbors and they stayed because they had hope because they did not fear death itself. So the gospel is telling us we can rejoice even now in the midst of a pandemic because our hope is secure. Thirdly, to rejoice with the truth means to rejoice in the truth of new life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The gospel tells us that in Christ, we are made new. That means we have new hearts through the forgiveness of sin. We have new identities by being adopted as his children. We have new purpose to live as agents of his eternal kingdom right now in this world. And we have a new destiny that is to reign with Jesus forever in the new heaven and new earth. So we rejoice. And then fourthly, finally, it means to rejoice in the truth about love itself. Listen to these words from John the Apostle. This is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see that? Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. He's telling us that we cannot love God, we cannot love others until we have been loved by God our Father. So what does it look like to rejoice with the truth? In Luke 15, Jesus tells one of his most famous stories, the parable of the prodigal son. Even people who don't know that story is in the Bible know the basic outline of the story. A wealthy man has two sons. The younger son is rebellious and disrespectful and demands his inheritance early and runs off and spends all that money in wild living. And when he spent all his money, uh, he winds up eating with the pigs and so he drags himself back toward his home in humiliation and shame, hoping just to be taken on as a slave on his father's estate. But his father welcomes him home with great joy, puts a ring on his finger and a robe on his back and throws a big party. He says, my son was dead and now he's alive again. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture of love and grace and forgiveness. And it's a picture of the love and grace of God the Father. But it's not the whole story because there is another brother. There's an older brother who never ran away, who didn't blow all his father's money, who stayed home, but who is not happy at all. In fact, he's angry and resentful. He doesn't think his brother deserves forgiveness. He doesn't think his brother deserves a party. He resents his, his father's grace toward his brother. And so he refuses to celebrate. He refuses to go to the party. And here's why. He doesn't understand the love of his father. 
He doesn't know the love of his father. And so he isn't able to love his brother. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul is teaching the Corinthians and God is teaching us that love does not delight in wrongdoing. Love does not delight in injustice. Love does not take joy in sin. But love does rejoice with the truth. Love celebrates the truth of God's word. Love celebrates the truth and power of the gospel. Love celebrates the truth of new life. Love celebrates when grace takes hold of a heart. Love celebrates when grace transforms a life. This is why John the Apostle writes, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. We're going to close our worship together today by remembering communion. And in the bread and cup, we remember just how much we are loved. So get your bread ready, get the cup ready there in your homes. You can do so as I pray, and then we'll celebrate communion together. Lord Jesus, thank you today for your word. For this ancient letter written long ago that's still so personal, so powerful, and so true. Remind us by your spirit that we are to be people of love people of truth, of grace, and of joy. Remind us that we can only grow in love as we know your great love for us. So remind us again as we remember you through bread and cup of your great love for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The New Testament tells us that long ago when Jesus met with his disciples at what we call the Last Supper, at one point he took bread and he blessed it and then he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Let's do this in remembrance of him. After the bread, Scripture says, Jesus also poured a cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. The Apostle Paul reminds us that as followers of Jesus, each time we drink from this cup, we remember his death until he comes again. Do this in remembrance of him.